Okay, welcome everybody. Here we are to uh, talk back, and we've got our friends from the University of Montana Department of Philosophy, uh, Professor Suzy Glombion, uh, joining us once again. How are you? Just fine. Thank you for having me. You bet. And we have a special guest here in the studio with us, and you are. Would you identify yourself? Please? I'm Tobin miller Shear. I'm the Director of African American Studies at the University of Montana, where I'm also an Associate Professor of History. Okay. Great to be here this morning. Great, great. I remember... When I went to the University of Montana about 5,000 years ago, uh-huh. <laughs> um, I, I attended a class by a remarkable gentleman named Ulysses Doss. Yes, he's the founder of the program. Right, and uh, he, um, uh, he had a program called Search for Identity. Mm, yeah, and mm-hmm. and uh, I, I I was totally captivated by uh, by Dr. Doss, and he was an amazing guy, brilliant uh, speaker. Yeah, very brilliant, and just very very captivating. Absolutely, guy. and he's still in Missoula, is he? Not? He is. Yeah. yeah, his health is troubling him, but he is the founder of the country's third oldest African American studies program here at the University of Montana. And that that, that was that was 1971. When 68. I, oh, you were the, you were there 71. I was in 71. So you would have been there about uh, three four years. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Good guy. So, so anyway, I'm really glad you guys are here um, because today we're going to be talking about, the, the, we always have a really cool topic to have you folks weigh <laughs> in on. And so uh, from what I understand, in these conversations, there are no right or wrong answers. We're just throwing stuff out there, right? And we're talking about racism That's today. Right. And so uh, who wants to, to start first? Because I know, Swazig, you're the one. Did you suggest this topic? Yes, I did. Okay, so why, why did you suggest the topic? Well, I suggested the topic because it's an important topic. Um, and uh, it's a topic that both uh, philosophers and people in African American studies uh, study very well. And it's a, a topic that's just so uh, important in our society right now. So uh, we should talk about it. Okay. So uh, let's, but from your perspective, uh, Doctor, if you wouldn't mind just sharing with us, you're, you're, you're a Caucasian. You noticed. Yeah, I, and, and, <laughs> and, and forgive me, I'm, I'm, I'm stating the Dr. Obvious thing here. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you are the director of the, of the African American Studies this is Program. This true. Let me tell you about so, it. <laughs> so the how, first, did you, how did you score this yeah, gig? Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, the first thing I do on every day, the first day of class, is I look at my students and say, you may have noticed that some occasionally will walk in and walk out after they take a look at me. <laughs> and I say to my students, I want you to know that I know I'm white. That's absolutely important that we're clear about that. We've got that uh, out on the table. And I say there's always going to be tension in me as a white guy working at this issue. But I also think one of the things I can do as a white person teaching African-American studies is demonstrate that, in fact, African-American history is something that we all should know about. It shouldn't just be something that people of color know about or particularly African-American. And let me ask you this. Do you, and I'm sure you have in your career, but have you ever gotten some blowback from from folks in the African American community saying, "Hold on a minute, how, how, how can you, as as mm-hmm. as a white guy, mm-hmm. how can you possibly understand all that's gone on with African American, the African American experience, uh, especially since slavery and and until the present? Uh, how how can you possibly absorb and and be able to, you know, have the passion to be able to teach right. this right. subject?" Well, I've been in very careful conversa- uh, conversation with my black colleagues about my work in this field. And there's always been conversations, but we would be self-defeatist to think that it would be impossible for me as a white person to have some kind of facility and expertise about a topic, as again, as I said, we all should know. And if I can't be in a position of being able to help my students know that, then it's just a, it's a bankrupt right. pro- uh, process right. to right. begin with. Okay. I certainly hope that some male people can, can you know, talk about feminism. Sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's true. Okay. It's a good parallel. I wanted to ask, uh, since it is a philosophy discussion, mm-hmm. what is racism as uh, the two of you would define it from your different fields? I'll go ahead and start. Go ahead. So as a historian, I would begin by noting that we have to have a conversation about race before we can talk about racism. And as such, one of the... Uh, points of agreement across the historical field is that race is a biological myth, but a social reality. It has been constructed and put in place over time, and as such, we have to understand that process in order to deal with it and have conversation about it today. Right, so um, same here, and there's a very similar uh, pattern in philosophy. Philosophers all agree, or philosophers typically make a difference between racialism and racism. So the racialism is just an empirical claim about the existence of races. 
And that has, as just Tobin said, um, that has been debunked. There is no such thing as biological races. They don't exist. It's not a biological thing. It is, if it is something, it's a social construct that was imposed on population uh, on populations at the moment where we uh, were engaging in slavery and colonization. Um, so that's, that's the consensus. And then there's issues of racism, and racism would be defined as something uh, along the philosophical lines, something which includes the, the, the belief in existence of race, uh, so includes racialism, but also um, has uh, some kind of inferiorization and antipathy, antipathy against uh, certain races. So the, the idea that certain people, uh, because of their so-called race, uh, should be treated differently. Okay. All right. Um, so I wanted to step back to the the myth section. Uh, we've we'll got to go to break. Yeah, we'll, uh, yeah. When, we we, when you get back, you can answer minutes, it. Because so, yeah. a lot That's of people good. hear that uh, that race is a myth, and they think, well, you know, as soon as uh, the gentleman walked in the room, Peter knew he was Caucasian. He knew what, I figured that quote, out right unquote, <laughs> race he was part of. Uh, uh, you know, if uh, people meet uh, Asian Americans, they might have an idea about what race racial background they come from. So what part of it do you think is a myth? And, and mm-hmm. I mean, doesn't genetics exist, et cetera? Mm-hmm. And where, where can we go with yeah. that? We're, we're going to come right back, talk about this. By the way, we have four lines open, and I'm hoping <coughs> for a spirited discussion this morning. 721-1290 is our number, 1-800-568-5309. We're going to come right back. Okay, we are back. Uh, 721-1290 is our number, 1-800-568-5309. Swazi Globion with us, uh, Tobin miller Shearer, Director of African American Studies at the University of Montana. So we do have a caller right away, and that's what we like. We have oh, we, we don't, we don't, we don't. Go ahead. <laughs> we do have a caller, but Dave's a patient guy. I just Hang wanted on. to wrap up my Hang last on, question, yep. but mm-hmm. the follow-up sure. about, you know, there's so many people that say, you know, when they think of race, it comes quick to their mind. They can right. name even probably the different races, the people that they think exist. So... When you call it a myth, what, what are you trying yep. to talk about there? Sure. So we're trying to differentiate, first of all, between race as a matter of biology and genetics versus race as a matter of social um, socialization and social formation. So there's no science, for example, indicating that there's any sort of um, biological genetic reality to a black person or a white person. Person. It's far more genetically significant whether you have loops, whirls, or arches on the end of your fingertips, whether you are lactose intolerant, whether you are uh, susceptible to the sickle cell anemia, than it is any sort of racial um, designators we would note. Smithsonian uh, identifies the size of one's buttocks as a racial designator. And in my classes, I break this down to uh, indicate just how hard it is to really differentiate what a race is. And scientists for a long time have noted that there's far more variety within any given identified racial group than there is between any two identified racial groups. So, so that's the genetics. So basically, if you, if you had, uh, let's say, 10 human beings uh, lined yes. up for an autopsy, okay, mm-hmm. and they're totally covered, and you have no idea uh, uh, until you, you cut in you, the same organs, same blood, same everything's in exactly the Absolutely. same places. So you would not be able to tell from one to another what, what race they were unless you pulled the, pulled the sheet back and actually, and actually saw the, the, the color of their skin. And then it would be far more difficult to actually identify what racial group. I mean, your statement that people know the racial groups, I think we could identify black, white, Latino. But where do you go from there? And scientists have come up with 48, 74, 96 different racial groups. And it always breaks, breaks down to the fact there's far more variety within a given group than there are between them. Okay. So those were basically constructed, and they were constructed uh, in the ni- 18th, 19th century. And that's a rest- you know, historical fact. We were constructed at the moment where basically we were engaging as, uh, as Westerners in, into slavery and colonization. And part of the reason why... Philosophers and scientists at that time constructed that myth. Myth is because, in a sense, I mean, arguably, it's because they wanted to reconcile what they were doing with the ideals of enlightenment, which said that there was universal equality b- among men, and that was not consistent with the behavior we had. So, in a sense, they were making up for that inconsistency by creating this myth. Okay, let's get to the phone now. And uh, Dave, you are on Talk Back with our guests. Hi. Hi, I'd I'd like to get right into it. Racism and frisking or patting down. It appears as though it's against the law because uh, there was a program that was aimed mostly at black men. But uh, from what I can gather, 
if Donald Trump was to institute what he wants to do and frisk all of us, men, women, uh, equally, black and white, that it would be, it would be perfectly legal. Just cool. to catch everyone up, Dave's comments are about the stop and frisk procedures in right. New York City, which was uh, instituted, or uh, the, the, I believe it was under the former uh, mayor before um, Bloomberg, which was, um, help me out, the 9-11 mayor. Um, oh, Rudy Giuliani. Rudy Giuliani. Yeah. And he praised Rudy recently, Donald Trump did, uh, for the police measures that were instituted at the time. So I guess Dave really did bring it right back home, because right now racism and uh, the and the police in, in America seems to be the big conversation. Right. So uh, if you want to dip your toes into that conversation, sure, yeah, that'd be absolutely. great. Thanks, Dave. I mean, we're talking about the larger con- conversation here about racial profiling and how the criminal justice system has responded in particular to black men, although black women are also a part of the conversation more recently. Some of the best scholarship we have indicates, for example, that a black driver is two times more likely to be stopped by the police, even though a white white drivers are 49% more likely to have contraband in their car. And that just indicates some of the irrationality of the larger pattern of black men being stopped simply for DWB, driving while black. So any proposal that a um, frisk and stop policy would be universally implemented simply um, flies in the face of the history and present practice of racial profiling in this country. And still we deal with that underlying reality of racial profiling we'll still see that being instrumental in the criminal justice practices across this country. Right. And, okay. and that stopping uh, is important, right? Because um, there, was, there was a very, I don't, I don't know uh, if they have heard about it, but there was this study that, w- that made a lot of uh, a noise recently about the fact that, in fact, um, it was not the case that uh, pe- black people were, had a higher chance to be uh, killed uh, by uh, police. The problem with that study is that it didn't take into account the fact that black people are more arrested. So once they are arrested, there was not that much difference. But the problem is that there are so many more arrests when you are black that the chances to get killed as an unarmed uh, black person, uh, man, sorry, is 3.5 as uh, more likely than if you are an unarmed white man. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and just to link it back to our conversation about the myth of race, uh, some would say that, okay, you've established that race is a myth. It's very difficult to identify, et cetera. So let's just not talk about it. But my argument has been and continues to be that we need to have greater facility, more nuance, and more sophistication to talk about race because it is a myth and yet has a social reality. And most of us aren't equipped with that history, with that analysis, or a framework to talk about it because we think we know what we talk about, but we don't know what we don't know. And that's very dangerous. So I want to take your take on something. Um, Oftentimes people will talk about, uh, let's say, religious ideologies, or they'll talk about um, different uh, governmental systems and be accused of racism. Do you believe that that's inappropriate? Or can someone that, uh, for example, just despises Islam, and just use that as an example because it's a frequent one in our society, and talks bad about Islam all the time, can that be uh, an element of racism? Given the history of how Islam has been depicted in popular culture in this country and that has invariably been associated as a religious practice with peoples of darker skin color, race has to be part of that narrative. It has to be part of that dialogue. Um, I mean, as, as a, also a student of religion, I, I think we also want to have a conversation about how we can live in a re- religiously pluralistic society and respect each other, and then have conversations about those layers that are in place, such as w- of, of race around um, uh, Islamic practitioners as well. We okay. need to have both conversations. Believe it or not, we're up against another break, but we have Catherine and Barry, who both want to visit with you, so we're de- definitely generating some phone calls. John's on the other line. Well, they have st- still have one line open. 721-1290 is our number. Tobin miller Shear and Swazi Globion from the University of Montana uh, Philosophy Department. We're talking about racism. Um, what do you think? Uh, we're going to get uh, Catherine, Barry, and Carrie on in just a moment, so stay with us. All right, we are back on Talkback. Uh, 721-1290 is our number. Uh, lines are filling up, so let's get right back right back to the phones and uh, get Catherine on first. Catherine, you're on with our guests, uh, Tobin and Swazik. Hi. Uh, good morning. Okay. Ra- racism is a term that is thrown around with great abandon on the, uh, these days. 
uh, with a, a fluid definition that encompasses any behavior or opinion that one person holds that another person disagrees with. So racism um, becomes a, a word without a definite meaning, it, it, it seems to me. It is now being used to erase history in this country. Uh, Andrew Jackson's statue in New Orleans um, is, is one of the examples that I can come up with. Um, there's also a rise in the idea of, of microaggression, which seems to be racially uh, connected, uh, which seems to short-circuit uh, any sort of flow of exchange of ideas. And so um, at what point does pride in ethnic or family background or regional background, for that matter, become racist? And should that be subject to legal prescription or should it not? Wow. Okay. Thanks, Catherine. All right. So uh, several, several good uh, points thrown out there. So who wants to jump in on that? Uh, go ahead, Swazi. Um, okay, well, thank you, Keith, Catherine. I really appreciate that question. I think it's an important one to ask. Um, that's actually something that Tobin and I will um, disagree slightly um, on. Um, so I, uh, like, like you, I think that racism, in a sense, is a term that, is, that has been overused, and by being overused has become some kind of meaningless. Um, now, I do not agree with everything you said, but that part I suddenly agree with. And I would like to have a discussion. So I do admit that race, race as a biological thing is a myth. I do admit that it is a powerful social construct. All of this, I think, is really important to know. I do believe that if we call racist um, behaviors that are, that are not intentionally racist, then we are losing an important distinction between different um, uh, types of actions or, or behaviors that are um, different, uh, di distinct in, term in the level of more blameworthy, right, worthiness. Uh, so the, the full-blown racist who is going to treat um, African American or Native Americans or whatever uh, poorly because of their uh, race, uh, that is what to me is the full-blown racism and we should be able to call that racism the person who is has some racial anxiety for example is not fully comfortable or with it or tells a joke that is a racist joke but the joke is racist but the person maybe doesn't know about it those things i want to have different terms uh, and or if i participate as a white person in an institution which is um which is in a sense, racist, in the sense that it, it, it serves and benefits certain groups. I also want to say, maybe I'm, I'm in institutional racist, but I'm not a full-blown racist. And I want to be able to make those distinctions so that we don't have this sense, that, as, you, as you said, that it's so overused that it doesn't mean anything. Um, now, I'm, I'm going to stop here and not talk about the erasing history and microaggressions. <laughs> um, that's, I mean, that's... That's more, I would disagree with you on these, but I want to leave some space for, for Tobin to answer because he disagrees with me on that particular uh, question of whether we should call racist everything or not. And one of the things that's uh, really helpful about someone like Swazi and I coming in is that we do have these points of dis disagreement, but we've developed a vocabulary to, ha to have a conversation about them. And that's actually my point. I think that we need to develop a more sophisticated and detailed uh, vocabulary to talk about racism. So rather than getting rid of a term like racism, I think we need some clear qualifiers to talk about it. We need to be able to talk about institutional, individual, covert, overt, unintentional. But I think we don't gain anything by stopping to talk about the reality from the perspective of people of color who experience it as racism. And if we don't call it that, which is the experience of people of color, then we miss out that reality. And that has been the larger problem why, for example, I'll introduce a new topic here, we need the phrase Black Lives Matter. It's not because other lives don't, but because black lives haven't. And so we need to make that statement because our society doesn't value black lives. Isn't that more like affirmative action? We, we could go there also. We okay. could have a long conversation about affirmative action. I think at this point, when we're talking about the idea of Black Lives Matter, it's simply to note that our society has a, has a history and a present practice of devaluing those lives. And so the statement that black lives do matter is a embrace of that reality, and we, it's not necessary to say that all lives matter otherwise. Now, when you say that, you're talking, uh, using your five or six terms there, of institutional yes. racism yes. in the United States. Mm -hmm. that when we, we as a society devalue the lives of black people, you believe. I think the statistical reality is, has determined that for decades. Through our laws and institutions. 
through our laws, our institutions, and our practices. So we make a difference at this point between de jure and de facto racism post-1954 with Brown versus Be Board of Education. Segregation is no longer a legal reality. We no longer have apartheid in this country. But the de jure practice, the, excuse me, the de facto practices of segregation, of access to health care, of access to good transportation, of access to good education, have allowed those former segregation patterns to continue and in some cases proliferate uh, across our country. Tell you what, I want, I want to get a caller in before we take a break here. So, uh, Carrie, first of all, thank you for holding. You're on with our guests. What's your question or comment? Hello, Carrie? Kerry or Barry? Oh, okay, Kerry. Uh, uh, Kerry, yes, you're on, Kerry. Please go ahead, sir. All right, I have a, I have a question. I, uh, former law enforcement background, so I want to paint that a little bit. But I get frustrated, and you guys have already probably talked about this, but this notion of all these athletes wanting an honest conversation about race in America, and from my point of view, I don't think we're allowed to have an honest conversation about race. In America, no, no. Are you talking about the uh, the professional athletes who've begun to demonstrate about the uh, uh, yeah, pledge like, of elite, or like yeah. Colin Kaepernick, yeah, for example? Uh, right. Yeah, and they take away my only sanctuary away from political world. I want to get <laughs> lost in sports, and now I can't. <laughs> okay, but uh, anyway, it's really frustrating for me, uh, and, a, and a lot on that have had the ex life experiences that I've had. That there doesn't seem to be any culpability. Now there is no doubt there's going to be bad police officers that have mad, made bad choice choices. There's bad people in every line of work in everything. Name a profession or any profession you guys have worked at where you haven't had somebody bad around you. Right. That's going to happen. Now to now to make this assumption that institutionally police officers are racist is a fundamental misunderstanding of what they gotta do. Let's talk about that a little bit. Black Americans, through both CGEN and the FBI statistics, if you're a black male in the U.S. You're, you're, and you're killed, there's more than a 90% chance that you were killed by another black male. That wasn't caused by police. Okay. Now, what is a police officer's duty when you have these gang-related? You have black men killing black men in unprecedented numbers, and they've been doing it for years. We'll go back to the gangs of L.A., the gangs of Miami— the gangs of Chicago, they've been doing it for years. The black, the police response is, we're supposed to make these places safer. That is our duty. That's what we're, we're supposed to do. So what happens? What happens is, is you send resources into those neighborhoods in order to try to make it safer. The reality of that is that you're going to have more police officers in close proximity with dangerous men or killing each other in ways to try to stop that. So this notion that police officers are just wringing their hands until we can go mess with some black kid is offensive to me beyond reality. So yes, there are bad situations in this country, but institutional racism is not okay. just drives me absolutely insane what that does. Okay, here that you... gives no culpability on the black people killing each other and the response of society has to be to change that. Okay. Carrie we're... Now if black lives really matter, why don't they matter to blacks? Okay. We're going to we're going to we're going to take a quick break. Come right back. I, I guests really want to comment on that. So thank you for your call, Kerry, and thank you for your service in law enforcement. Uh, Roger's on the line too. We're going to, we have three lines open. We'll come right back and discuss all the, uh, the the aspects of what Kerry just said. We'll be right back. All right, we're back on Talk Back, and we're talking about racism with our friends from the University of Montana Department of Philosophy, Suaza Globion, Tobin Miller Shearer, a director of African American Studies. Okay, just had a rather impassioned uh, call from Kerry, and so uh, I, I know that you, both of you don't have to jump on the microphone, so Swazi, go ahead. Um, yeah, so thank you for your call. I think it's an important call to have. Um, and I hear the passion, and I know the passion is coming for a good heart, and I know the passion is coming for the fact that uh, law enforcement are putting their lives on the line, and we all appreciate that, and it's really important. Um, now, I also want you, um, to say that a few things uh, that you said are kind of misguided. Um, Oh, before I, I move to that, actually, I want to say you're right in a sense. So that's exactly my point. By calling the institutional racism just full-blown racism, we tend it tends to it tends to be counterproductive because people like you feel offended. It's like I'm not a racist, or my colleagues are not racist, um, and that's 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 a, a problem for me. That if we don't make those nuanced distinctions between what exactly is uh, where exactly racism is located. Now, um, concerning what you said. Um, 
one thing that's important to know is that the statistics I gave earlier, that when you are an armed black man, you are 3.5 times as likely to be killed um, than if you are an an unarmed white man. This doesn't correlate at all with crime rates. So it is not the case that black people, black men, get killed because of the crime rate. So those are very two different issues. And nobody says that the black on black crime is not a problem. The problem is that at least we all agree that black on black crime gets prosecuted. One problem for the people, for the, the black community, is that to a large extent, the kind of um, racist behavior or implicit racist behavior, whatever you want to call it, that happens within police enforcement, and it does happen, the statistics are here, are not um, prosecuted. And that's a real problem when it's coming from a, the, the federal institution or the, the state institution. We should have. Uh, equal rights and equal protection. Okay. Now, now, uh, Tobin, I wanted to ask you before you get into what Kerry sure. said, mm-hmm. because I hear all the time that that black on black crime is is like it's huge. It's it's a terrible problem. Why? 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 Why are there so many black men killing other black men? And 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 maybe perhaps it's just you know the the spotlight is on it. And maybe it isn't quite as bad as Kerry made it sound like. We have to understand that in the context that white people kill white people at nearly the same rates that black people kill black people, and the reasons are the same. They are in close proximity. White communities are segregated with white folks. Black communities live with black folks, and therefore you're going to see a higher rate of black-on-black and white-on-white crime. It's not in any way significantly different, which is my reason for responding to, to you, Carrie, by saying that my goal is not to go about demonizing the police, my goal is to help them do their job better. And we know the answers. We know that with community-based policing, with civilian oversight, and with good training that gives people the skills they need to identify and talk about the problem, which I would say is racism, then they can do a great job. And we have many examples across the country where police, um, where police officers have had those resources and the racial reality changes overnight. So it's not that we're out to to attack the police. Can you name one? Um, We've seen great strides down in in, uh, Phoenix, for example, as a community that uh, had had significant racial issues and began to implement these um, forces. New York City, back in the 40s, Martha Biondi has shown the ways in which community-based policing, civilian oversight, and good training. When you say community-based policing, what what would you define that? Yeah, so it's, it's putting people in the neighborhoods uh, having police officers live in the neighborhoods where they're where they are policing instead of driving in in high powered vehicles to try to intervene in situations after they got into a crisis do, point. Do, does some of that have to do with that nobody walks a beat anymore? Uh, it's a big th- part of it, absolutely. Yeah. And we've seen changes in places like Ferguson uh, post the rebellions there of a number of years ago where they're beginning to implement these very kind of policies. It's not that the police are, are the bad guys here in this instance. It's that they are ill-equipped and uninformed to would, do their jobs. Would you also say that there is a political component to this, that various groups have seized on this problem to, for political gain? It, on, on both sides of the issue? As much as any issue is politicized, I don't think this is disproportionately politicized, but has it been? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, we're, we're up against another break. Uh, so we have all four lines are humming here. So Roger, John, Michael, and Barry, we're going to get you guys on right after this. Stay with us. Okay, we're back, and we have ignored our folks on the phone, so let's get right to the phones, and we'll get as many calls in as we can here. Roger, first of all, thank you for holding. You're on with our guests. Go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to say you guys are having a great conversation today and appreciate your diverse panel and people being able to call in. I've got a few questions, though. Um, first one is I'd like to find out where everybody's getting their information as far as the statistics and everything, because I know if, if you take the city of Chicago, you're going to be picking up 9.7 black men out of every 10. If you're back here in Missoula, you know, who knows what it is, but I just kind of get confused and people throwing out numbers and they're not given, is it a national number where you're taking the whole population? Are you taking inner cities? How are you getting these numbers? Okay. That's the first question. The second question is a religious question, and I know that it's, you know, I'm just going to throw it out there. I'm no scholar. But both religions, the Christian religion, the Bible, whatever, and then you have Islam. Both religions, in some verse, I don't know any of them, but I know the general, yes, 
both preach and want their members to convert everybody else. And that's just the way it is. I mean, that's their goal. That's the goal of both religions is to convert everybody else. And my question is, how in this form did we get to a point where that uh, Islam religion has got to the extreme of uh, murder and that kind of a thing. That's my question. Okay. Whatever. All right. So I'm not sure what that has to do with the actual racism, but let, let, let's jump in first with where you get your numbers. Yeah, statistics Tell are me. really important, and as you note, they can be suspect. Understand that completely. Um, Swazi and I have both been quoting from a number, a recent article that came out uh, that summarized and synthesized the best scholarships available from independent scholars, and I think that's really important, that these are folks who are using the best methods we have to be able to establish what this racial reality is without pursuing any particular political agenda. Um, you can go on sites like Race the Power of an Illusion, put out by PBS, which is a really helpful sort of collecting point for a lot of those statistics. The FBI um, also uh, has begun to introduce and develop a, more, a, a better statistical database for looking at rac racial profiling, for example, and um, other crime-related statistics. So I, I encourage you to look uh, at theirs as a starting point. would be a great place to go. Okay, let's get uh, right back to the phone and say good morning to John. John, you're on TalkBack. Go ahead. Hey, good morning. Throw, talking about throwing out statistics, I have a few here. Okay. Uh, according to the FBI, uh, six per black, young black men comprise 6% of the population, yet are, are uh, guilty of 37% of cop killings. Cops are nearly 19 times more likely to be killed by a black than a black is to be killed by a cop. 12% of white and Hispanic homicides are committed by cops. 4% of black homicides are committed by cops. Blacks, who comprise 15% of the population in the 75 largest counties in this country, 15% they comprise, commit 57% of murders, 45% of assaults, and 62% of robberies, according to Heather McDonald of the Manhattan Institute. Finally, 95% of people killed by police are men. Should we start shooting more women? <laughs> okay. All right, thanks for the call. So uh, as far as what, uh, what, do you have any uh, correlation or able to talk about some of the statistics that... Uh, John just stated. Yeah, we're talking about rate of homicides. We're talking about uh, reaction of the uh, civilians to the police. I think these are all really important conversations to have and to have some larger context for them. Um, I would challenge a couple of those last statistics that were non-FBI ones. I think your other ones are, to my knowledge, correct and are part of those larger patterns of alienation between the police and, in this instance, the African-American community. Again, my solutions are not one to blame any individual police officer other than those we have clear records of racist behavior, but to change the relationship and the dynamic between communities of color and predominantly white police forces. How can we make those relation, ones of relationship where indeed the police are serving and protecting all the communities and not just communities that are named as go white? Ahead. Swasa, go ahead. Right. Um, one thing I wanted to introduce here, too, is that, um, and it's and another thing that to me it seems that talking too much about race um, uh, tends to um, tends to hide other factors. And to me, what an important factor in all the statistics is the socioeconomical background. And for someone who comes from France and comes and moves to the, uh, the U.S., I mean, obviously, I'm not a native. You all know that by, by now. Uh, <laughs> um, then what's remarkable is that here nobody talks about class. And I know it's not the – no, it might not – be the right uh, uh, place to talk about this. Maybe you you guys don't want to talk about it, but to me, it is crucial to understand that socioeconomical background is absolutely amazing. And I fear that many times talking too much about race serves to pit uh, poor whites and poor uh, black against one another in a counterproductive ways and in a way that doesn't um, allow these people to realize that a lot of the ills that they all suffer. Uh, from are due to social economical um, injustice. Okay, let's uh, move along. And Michael, thank you for holding. You're on Talkback. Go ahead. Good morning, John and Peter. How are you? Excellent. What's up? I don't have any questions per se. This is Talkback, and I guess society considers me as a black man. 
Um, although I, when they have the the questionnaire on what race I am, I mark them all. Okay. Because I have many races. All right. I think Kerry and his anger is what's promoting racism as a whole. The underlining tone would be because of the anger that's out there because of racial profiling that I'm a bad man or I, um, and I'm guilty just because of the way I look is definitely something that's to, to be reckoned with. I know uh, Rush Limbaugh every day is always talking about the negatives of the black man, and I'm not a murderer, I'm not a thief, but at the same time, women throughout Montana or wherever I go, they always hang on to their purses, or I have to work three times as hard for people's trust, and I believe I'm a trustworthy man, and it, it, there's an underlining tone of anger. If I get angry, boy, I tell you, <laughs> no one, you know, it's like, is he going to snap? And definitely if I carry a gun, uh, why, you know, um, it is it is definitely a lot different if you put your your feet in my moccasins. So so, so there's a double standard in your... In oh, your, big time. Yeah. And, and I'm not one to jump up and down about racism. I try to just blend, but at the same time... If I step out, and I usually do with thought, uh, challenging the qu- uh, status quo, the hammer comes down on me a lot more than the average person just because of the way I look. Well, Michael, we appreciate your call. Thank you. You're welcome. Take care of yourself. We're going to come right back, and uh, we'll, that we'll have our guests answer that. This is a one-minute break, so we'll be back in 60 seconds. Okay, we are back. Just had a, a very pretty powerful call from Michael of his experiences. So, uh, uh, Tobin, if you wouldn't mind commenting. Yeah, absolutely. On Michael, thanks for your call and for that um, testimony of your experience. And I think you raise an important issue where much of our conversation thus far has focused on the effects of racism on communities of color, particularly on black communities, and you articulate that reality very well. I think we also have to recognize that if we let that conversation simply be focused in that direction, we miss one of the most important and foundational aspects of racism in this country, and that is that the systems that I I would talk about and describe in, in my classes is ones that have been designed to serve, promote, and protect the white community. So I have experiences as a white person that give me power and privilege, which are mediated by class, which are mediated by gender, but yet I can walk down the street and I will not be assumed to be a threat to the people around me in the way that you just described. And that's also one of the ways that racism works. Oh, yeah, I can, um, I mean, a, a few things here. Um, your experience is, 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 um, is very, very real. I mean, I, I, one of my students currently is, is uh, coming from Nigeria and he's <laughs> the nicest guy in the world. Um, he studies environmental philosophy. There's, you know, he wants to uh, learn about environmental philosophy to work in his country uh, to fight against um, uh, environmental disasters. And uh, he decided not to drive, right? So coming to the United States, he decided not to drive. And when he came to find an apartment, it took, uh, you know, 10 times, and I'm not making that up, 10 times he uh, answered to an announcement for an apartment being renting, uh, being available. He shows up. And as soon as he shows up and people see his face, um, then the apartment is not available Which anymore. Which is completely illegal, of course. Of course, but yeah. how do you prove that, right? I how know, do you I prove know. you can't? I, I understand, but yeah, but, but at least the statute exists. Absolutely, absolutely. But as, as a day-to-day basis, um, it is extremely hard for any person who is white to realize what it is, right? I dated <laughs> in France, so the racism doesn't go so much against uh, blacks. It does, but it's more important against Arabs. And I, um, uh, so I dated someone for 12 years in France, and every day we would have systematic um, little things that happen, and they're just, it's amazing. And he was strong. He would never get angry. I was the one getting angry <laughs> because I'm allowed to, right? Because nobody's going to be right. upset at me if I get angry. He sure. would be extremely strong. Okay, let's let's get Barry on the line. Barry, thank you for holding. You're on Talk Back. Go ahead. Yeah, guys, thanks for taking my call. And I'm sorry, maybe this has been addressed already. I missed a little bit of the program, but Go right ahead. I wanted to ask, uh, why is the African come in front of the American and the African American studies? And and for the French gals, are there African French? I mean, is that how they identify? I would think we could all come together as Americans first, but why not, you know, Americans of African descent? Okay. Um, I all think right. when you put the 
the applicant first, you're automatically, you know, dividing. Um, okay, anyway, so thank we'll, you. We'll have them uh, address that. So go ahead. Yeah, the the whole history of naming within the African American community has been a complex and changing one where we could trace the ways in which that community has been referred to from outside, being called very derogatory terms that I won't name here, to a move by the 1960s of that community beginning to say, we have a right to claim our own identity. And around that time, there was a shift to identifying the roots that the community uh, looked to back on the continent of Africa in order to establish some of their cultural heritage and rootage. And that's actually been shifting more just in the last number of, uh, I'd say the last decade, to an acknowledgement that due to the diaspora, the spreading out of Africans through the forces of slavery, there are those who identify more with, for example, the Caribbean than they do the continent of Africa. And so there's been a turn towards um, talking about black studies, and that's an ongoing conversation. There are other arguments for why we'd have African-American, but I think the idea here is that there's a group of people who have said that we are claiming our Americanness, but in the context of some of our dissent as well. Okay, we have two minutes. Go. Okay, two minutes. Uh, I think it's an interesting question um, because it, it goes back to the slight disagreement we have, Tobin and I. Um, I do think that in many ways, uh, race um, or the, the term race can be overused and is sometimes counterproductive. And I feel like we should have better ways to talk about diversity. And since race, this notion of, of, of black race was imposed from the from, from the outside on on black on the people of on, on black people, um, there is a way in which um, I feel they could be imprisoned in this, and it would be counterproductive to stay within only this and not recognize that this is not a homogeneous uh, group and um, that we have to think about diversity in different ways than on the basis of a myth. All right. We have, we have exactly like a minute and a half left. So rather than take another call and jump into a whole new topic, so uh, I, I would like both of you, if you wouldn't mind giving us 30 seconds just to wrap up uh, about what you've experienced in, in this uh, time together with our, with our listeners and um, just your general philosophy going forward. Well, it demonstrates to me just how important this conversation is at any point in the United States. We all have something that we've been socialized by. We have opinions about what's going around us, even if we're living in very racially homogeneous communities. Again, my argument is that we need to be more sophisticated. We need to have more nuance, and we need to be grounded in history and present practice in order to have a conversation about race. It's like some organizers say about the topic, the way out is not to, to ignore the present reality. The way out is to go deeper into the present reality. And we, in our program at African American Studies, University of Montana, that's what we're in the business of doing. Okay. So, Swazik, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Tobin. Um, uh, yes. Got about 30 uh, I mean, seconds. We have uh, a lot of agreement with Tobin. Um, the only se- so, for me, the most important thing is that people should know that races don't exist, in a sense, it's except as social constructs, powerful social constructs. And I wish we could move towards a society where that mythology is not a basis for most of our institutions and most of our behavior. All right. Well, thank you both for coming. Uh, go ahead, John. Yeah, tomorrow, uh, join us. We'll be talking about the debates tonight. Uh, we'll have a couple of random guests floating in, but a lot of discussion about what happens between Trump and Hillary on the air tonight. Oh, yeah. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Again, thank you uh, to uh, to Tobin and to Swazik, both you. of you, for being with us. We appreciate thank it. Thank you. Uh, always a, a good discussion when you guys are here. Agree or disagree, that's what the show is all about. Have a great day, everybody. <laughs>